There we go. Okay, speed on A. Everybody good? You have speed, right? Yep. All right. Whoa. You don't have to kill it. All right, on you. Cool, cool. If you would, Bill, just start at the beginning. And uh, I remember you had told us you went to the Fillmore East and then decided New Orleans needed something similar. So that just started at the very beginning. Well, I, I was living in Chicago, and I moved there in 66 uh, and, and lived there through 69. Um, during that era, um, I was uh, working in the bars in Chicago as a bartender, bouncer, collecting IDs, checking IDs, and uh, the last place I worked was a place called Barnaby's. And uh, on, on a Sunday night, they had alternating groups that would play, and one was called The Big Thing at that time, and 40 years later, they still call it Chicago today. So in 1960, late 68, early 69, Jim Gershio, who pr was going to produce their CD, their album, it was albums at that time, and uh, took them to New York, signed them with Columbia Records, and they were recording the Chicago Transit Authority album in, the, uh, in New York. They told me, they invited me to come. I, I went there for a weekend, and I got to see them record. Does anyone really know what time it is? And I'm a man. Uh, also, while they were there, uh, I went with them to uh, a live gig that they had at, at Bill Graham's Fillmore East. They opened up for Buddy Miles. And it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And I said, God, man, we didn't have anything like this in New Orleans. So I went back to Chicago. Uh, I was living, uh, living with uh, two other guys, and they were also working in that near north uh, part of Chicago. And uh, I told them, I said, we got to go to New Orleans. So I got a great idea. Let's go open up this place and, um, and book bands and invite people in. So they said, okay. Uh, and nothing really happened immediately. Then um, an attorney friend of mine, when we decided to come down here, who lived in Chicago, uh, Joe Garlewski, said, when you go to New Orleans, you have to find, look up this attorney by the name of John Simmons, and he'll help you out. I said, okay. So I came to New Orleans. I contacted John Simmons, and we started trying to find a place. And uh, we did. 1820 Chapatula Street. Chapatula is in Felicity. It was a warehouse building. It was um, basically, uh, I want to say it was like five bays of warehouses that was all enclosed. And after we actually got it, we had to literally open it up. So I went back to Chicago, told my two roommates what we had. They decided they were going to come down. They wanted to be involved, and the three of us were going to start it. And also, uh, some other friends of ours were going to come as well to help us with it and work with it, uh, Don Fox and Brian Glenn and a couple other folks. And right in the beginning when we were doing the construction, the place wasn't even open yet, my two roommates decided, nah, we don't want to do this. And uh, Don and Brian became partners. And uh, eventually, John Simmons became the uh, fourth partner. And that was it. That's how it basically started. It was just that we had no idea what we were doing. We had no money. We had nothing. <laughs> you know, and uh, we had a lot of uh, willpower. We had a lot of friends who lent us money. Um, we just did everything we possibly could to get it going. A, a gentleman by the name of Hank Newman literally booked the first show, The Grateful Dead, Fleetwood Mac, and The Flock. He was in Chicago, and he was a booking agent. And he sort of made the introduction for us with, to, to all these agencies. Did I answer it? Absolutely. Okay. Let's Just check it. Uh, where were bands playing before the warehouse? Was there anything? Well, they had, you know, a lot of the, they had a lot of local clubs. You know, I, I wasn't living here then, so I didn't really, I didn't know what was happening. But there were clubs where a lot of the local bands played. Uh, I know even growing up in New Orleans, we would go to the uh, Sacred Heart dances and St. Anthony dances, Germania Hall, and a lot of the local bands played. Um, there was not one, or there may have been, but I, I just didn't know of, of one huge venue where they played. 
Um, besides municipal auditorium, when acts would come in, you know, to do major concerts. Uh, if you would just describe the inside of the warehouse to somebody who's never seen it. Oh, it was uh, we we when we went in and did the renovation, we basically just opened it up completely, uh, built the stage, built bleaches around the outside of it and behind if the stage was right here behind the bleachers that were back there we had a concession area and the floor was nothing but carpet remnants um, that was it where'd y'all get those from uh, people who wanted to donate them you know the first carpet that was laid the, all it wasn't carpets that were laid it was remnants yeah, so just, we would just go to stores and just whatever remnants we can get but large sections of carpet and eventually, we kept them clean. We kept the place as clean as we possibly could. But when the, when the uh, carpets started getting a little funky, we uh, would go on the radio, WRNO at that time, uh, and WNOE FM. I think it was RNO mostly that we would tell them that we needed carpets. So when people would deliver carpets to us, we'd give them free tickets to get into the shows. It was a kick. So you said in Chicago you were working at a bars was a, did you have any experience actually running a business or were you just a worker up there I was a worker it, so you know all of us rate. all of us were workers we really um, it wasn't like today in corporate America where you do your business plan and you get your money together and you do all these the good things and the right things which you should do and perhaps we should have done it because we had a lot of financial issues during those, those if, I was with the business for the first five years and we had we definitely had a lot of issues so uh, but it was like it was a dream it was uh, something we really wanted to do that we felt would be successful, and uh, we worked hard. I think. <laughs> so, uh, in the beginning, uh, it was a warehouse, and then it was the warehouse. Well, if you clear that up for the audience. Yeah. Well, initially, we we started it as a warehouse because that's what it was. It was a warehouse. But eventually, all the people that came in, no one called it a warehouse. Everybody called it the warehouse. So we changed it. And we would do, for the, for the staff that worked there, and also for the groups, we got these LSU jerseys, and we had a company just sew on the letters that said Warehouse New Orleans to give to the groups so they could take it out, spread the word for us as well. And it, were, it wasn't just like, uh, a funky looking t-shirt it was a really nice jersey and we just had on that just warehouse but people called it all over the place the warehouse eventually so we changed the name you know just sort of nothing official but just change it calling it that tell us about opening night opening night before the crowd gets oh. there when it was just the staff I'll, I'll never forget this guy Osley that was traveling with the Grateful Dead he has his own reputation. And he came in, and, uh, and, and he was really upset because we didn't have this, you know, the sound system we had in it, the sound and light system. Well, none of us really knew about that at the time. It wasn't like a group. Today they send you a 35-page writer. Uh, we didn't have any of that. And we just did the best we could. So... Um, you know, what we did when we realized it was going to be a problem, you know, with him, um, we, we contacted some sound and light people in town and, you know, supplemented what we had. But it was, uh, it was, it was truly like, it, it was a relief in the sense that, God, we finally got this place open. This is great. I mean, we didn't make any money. We lost money that night, the first night. I think only about 1,500 people came. I don't know exactly, but... I just remembered that we didn't make money, and but we know it's a new business and got to wait till people get here. And I mean, at that part, at that time, it was not one of the better parts of town, you know. And we had problems with that. So, but it was really, uh, it was really a lot of fun. I think when it was all over, said and done, you know, we kind of like, we did it. We pulled it off. We actually did this thing, and it was a great show, long show, but it was it was a great show. Do you remember how much you had to pay the bands? Uh, no. no. Uh, I'm thinking... Was that a flat rate or was it usually a split? Well, 
most groups in that era did a flat rate and or a split, it just depending on who the group was and how popular they were. But uh, for some reason to me, I'm thinking, you know, the $7,500 is somewhere up in there. But Don Fox can give you all that information because I'm sure he has records since day one. Yeah. Um, we could have stepped back a little bit before we actually opened. Uh, problems with the fire marshal, I heard? Well, there were, there were uh, issues like opening any business. You know, you have to go through all the hoopla. And, uh, you know, here was a, a business that knowing that we were going to invite people to come in and it was going to be general admission, no reserve seating, so you couldn't go out and just count the seats. Uh, the fire marshal gave us, we had some issues with him and a few other little issues, but that, that's to be expected. Yeah. What did he give you as max capacity? Uh, 3,500. I th and I'm again. That's just when you know. That's the 70s, <laughs> and I'm uh, I'm thinking that's what it was. 3,500. When did you hear that the Grateful Dead got busted? About f Fox and I were living together, and um, 424 Metairie Road. They're building a church. They tore down that house, and they're building a church there right now. I just passed it the other day. What a kick. Um, we were, we were um, living there. We both, I'm sound asleep in my room, and he's, all of a sudden he got, must have got the phone call because he comes in, he wakes me up, and says the Grateful Dead got busted. So we had to get John, and John Simmons got him out. We had him the next night, and then we, uh, then we wound up, we even had a benefit for him on, this, on the uh, Sunday night just to raise money to give to him. Was that like a spur of the moment, hey, that's just open up on Sunday? Or were y'all usually open on Sunday? No, well, we were open. We, didn't, we weren't open on any particular day. We were open whenever we can get the band. So whenever a band was available, that's when we did the show. But we figured that um, they had that little bit of, you know, that trouble, that bust, and, and we just wanted to do whatever we could to assist them financially, not knowing they probably had a gazillion dollars hid somewhere, you know. The first time they played, I don't remember. I really don't remember. I, I just remember that when they did play, they play there a lot. Um, they, um, I mean, when, when Dwayne, and, and Dwayne Allman and Barry Oakley were with them, um, they, were, they were always a great band. But fr from the beginning, the first time we saw them, they were just spectacular. And they, the people of the city of New Orleans, just really young people, just took to them. I mean, it was just amazing how great they were. And um, they would play forever. You know, they would just go on. They would start at whatever time, and they'd wind up playing three, four, five hours, you know, sometimes. If we could elaborate a little bit more on that. A lot of people said it was, uh, it was almost a perfect marriage. Uh, they were kind of just starting and needed a place where they could spread their wings, and New Orleans embraced them more than most other cities. A lot mm -hmm. of their shows, uh, even at the Fillmore's, were only our sets and then they right. out where they right. felt the warehouse was, was home almost. Yeah. Well, we didn't have any, we didn't have any curfew with, with time limits as far as the opening act had to play a half an hour. We didn't have that. New Orleans, as you know, didn't have any time limits. So we could go as long as we want. I'm telling you, there were some shows that would start at 8 o'clock and wouldn't be over. Did, at 3 o'clock, they'd be done. You know, many, many, many mornings, I'm out of that place real late. Um, it was just depending on the act, and other acts would do it too. Don't ask me to name them all because I don't remember. <laughs> but you would tell us about them playing late and then going into Audubon Park. They did that a lot. They didn't do it initially, but then they eventually started. Uh, they would play the warehouse on a Friday or Saturday and go play, the, uh, for example, play up in Audubon Park on a Sunday. And people, and, and they would, you know, you'd have to pay five dollars to see them at the warehouse. They play for free up at Audubon Park. Five hours. Think about it now. I saw I saw one of those warehouse posters. I was going to open a place right before Katrina, and I was going to have a warehouse wall of fame because so many people were talking about it. I mean, I knew the warehouse was a fun place to go, and I knew a, a lot of people went to it. But I, I really didn't have the the, um, the understanding of how how much it meant to so many people. I mean, I knew a lot of people had fun there, 
but when, when I was going to open this place uh, in 2005, uh, it really hit me, you know, from all the people that I was talking to, and it just hit me. So I decided I was going to do this Warehouse Wall of Fame. And people were bringing me all kinds of things to put in the Warehouse Wall of Fame. And I was just going to borrow it from them, put it behind lock and key, and just use it as a wall to sort of like acknowledge this, this, this venue. And one of the things that somebody brought me was that Doors poster from the last night the Doors played in December the 12th, 1970, for $5. You got to see Jim Morrison go crazy, break the stage, try to break the stage, and did break it a little bit. Let's keep going. Tell us, tell us that uh, last door show from beginning to end. Everything. <clears throat> well, I just knew he was um, he was not in you know the best of shape all day long. When I came in for the sound check, he just seemed like he was loaded. Uh, and and that night, and it just didn't. I mean, I'd seen footage of him on TV or wherever, and he didn't seem to. Um, I don't know if he had problems of some sort or he was just you know, just loaded or whatever, but um, it wasn't one of his better shows, and it seemed like he was really frustrated and, and you know, at one point grabbed the mic and started, I mean, and it was, this, this stage was built sturdy. Um, but he wound up breaking the floor a bit, you know. Remember what songs they played? No. I'm gonna get some water. Yeah, get some water. Get some water too. Yeah, that's all in the water. I'm gonna stay water. Is this this is okay? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, you just keep rolling and whatever. Oh yeah, the interview. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Is it all right? I mean, okay. Um. Back going up. Now. Did Beaver Productions start <clears throat> as the business behind the warehouse, or, or was it two separate entities? No, it was when, when I came down and found, we found the building, uh, John told me we needed, to, we needed to form a corporation. So Beaver Productions was the corporation, and uh, the operating business was the warehouse initially. You know, and then I know I, know I left and... Uh, I was there for the first five years and left, and I know Don, he's, it's still in existence right now. It's just that it moved out. Eventually, uh, what I think happened, and you can, when you speak with him, I'm sure he can give you more information, I think they had fewer and fewer shows after uh, 75 because more of the concerts were moving to the bigger auditoriums and arenas and things like that. But I know he still had some pretty good shows, and I think the, I think the last show was in 82. Somebody asked me to, uh, to ask you about the Pink Floyd show and uh, if you enjoyed it. Your account. Yeah, George. I loved it. If you would they to tell us about the, the, the yeah, Pink Floyd. You said there was a little story behind it that you would, uh, you would know. Would there tell is. <laughs> I don't remember it. I mean, I don't remember. I, what I remember about the Pink Floyd show was that it was the first time in the warehouse that this quadraphonic sound was set up. And at one point, you literally thought you were hearing people walk on the roof around. But it was, they were awesome. I mean, it was a great show. I don't know what his story, what George's story is. Um, and then uh, their truck ended up getting stolen? The next morning we got a call that their, their, the entire truck was stolen. You know, not just some of the equipment, everything was gone, which was so weird. And, I mean, the only thing we could really do was we called uh, the radio station to see if they can kind of just tell people about it. And if anybody found out anything, call the police, I guess. Uh, it, was, uh, it was just a very strange story. So, I don't know. Well, it came back, yeah. They found it. They did find it, and everything came back, and nothing was missing. Odd? Very odd. Do you think someone would steal a truck and not take anything out? I, I don't know. Or do you think the police moved it? I don't know. But I know the phone call we got was that it was stolen. 
So, and I'll. <laughs> All right, let's move up a bit. Uh, when did the bar get installed? I don't remember the exact year. I do remember that the reason why we wanted to do it was we, we really, we had some good shows, but, but when you have a good show, you might make a little bit of money. When you have a bad show, you lose a lot of money. So we figured if we could have a bar in there, that was separated from the rest of the audience because you didn't have to be, you could be coming at any age. Uh, we could probably generate some income from that, make a little bit of money to help us, you know. And um, after the hoops and hollers and all the things that we had to do to go through that process, we had to elevate the area and we did. Um, uh, we, it was just fun. It was fun. It was a fun place for folks a little older, over 18 at that time, they get in and go, but the people that were under 18 stayed, um, you know, could stay down in the general admission area for any age. So, uh, early 70s shows oh, you, at the warehouse. Pardon me? Early 70s shows at the warehouse, you would have 13, 14 year old people in there? The people who, he would, all kinds of people would come in. One of the fun things I've heard Again, this was like in 2005 from when I'm in meeting people, uh, and particularly from, from women. They would always, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story, but the woman would say, God, I'd love the warehouse. I used to go there all the time, and my parents thought I was at a friend's house studying ballet lessons or something. They had some fill in the blank, and it was just incredible. You know, because a lot the parents didn't. Um, a lot of the parents didn't like again that era, that long hair and the hippie thing and the whole deal. They just didn't like it. They didn't understand it. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, Bobby Reno was that he was like one of the top disc jockeys at that time, and he was uh, at WNOE. And he called me one day, and he says, "Bill, he says, you know, the parents do not like the music you're playing here." And they don't like the music we play on our radio station. He was with WNOE FM at the time. He says, what we ought to do is have a free concert. I said, fine. Talked with Brian, talked with Fox. Everybody was in agreement. Let's do it. We'll donate. We'll put up the warehouse and the staff. They'll bring a group in of some sort, and we'll do a free show. That would really get these parents. So I asked Bobby, he said, well, who are you going to get? He says, I don't know. I have to get one of the... Uh, local promotion guys to, to find somebody. A couple weeks later, uh, he comes back and he says, we got Gino Vanelli. I said, who? Never heard of him. Never heard of him. So I said, fine. And when he came there, this was a rock and roll place. And when Gino Vanelli came there to play this free concert, when he came out on stage, there was no guitars. I mean, he had four keyboard players that played like 16 uh, synthesizers. Uh, it was a kick and a half. But he was phenomenal. And, and that performance at the warehouse really sort of uh, broke his career here in New Orleans. Because in, in 75, he played his first headline concert ever in his entire life. It was here in New Orleans at Municipal Auditorium, and he sold out, which was great. And he's been back played right here at Harris five times in the last two years and still selling out. Yeah. If you would tell us the Fog Hat, who had a pretty good relationship with the warehouse, they lived here and started playing semi-regular. They, they did play. Uh, initially, I don't remember, I don't recall exactly how we met them, but, pardon me? How you met? Fog Hat. Uh, don't recall how we met Foghat, but they, they came here. They were a great little group. Uh, and, you know, during that five years I was with the group, we had, we had some problems. Again, financial problems that I, I shared with you before. And um, we had a number of times where people rescued us. Chicago played a free concert for us at one point. Um, <clears throat> at another time... Uh, a guy that worked for us, John Diaz, who uh, 
worked, worked at the warehouse, his father, Dr. Walter Diaz, um, lent us a whole bunch of money. Uh, Don's family lent us some money. I had some friends lend us some money. I mean, like I said, there was three or four or five times we were going to close. Well, one of the times, Fog Hat played. And in our publication, In Your Ear, um, we actually printed In Your Ear to have it ready for the closing of the warehouse. Even wrote in it, it was closed and listed all the acts that had ever played there. And, uh, but we, you know, we stayed open. It was one of those times where we did stay open. And Fog Hat was one of the acts that did play for us and did that. And people loved them. Great little group. Great bunch of guys. So we were going to close after the Fog Hat show. Do you make enough money on that to, to keep you afloat, or was it a decision? To well, I, I, don't, I don't recall exactly what happened, but uh, I do know that we had enough money to get to the next one, and maybe we got some more somewhere along the line. And I, George Friedman should have answered that question for you. Or Brian Glenn. Do you have Brian's? Brian Glenn. I, I have to see if I can get you Brian Glenn's phone number. Okay. He lives... He's in Chicago. Okay. He lives in, the last time I heard he was in Chicago. Fox may know when you talk to Fox. If you would, uh, tell us the story you told me the other day about seeing the Eagles here in town. Oh, yeah. Henley, uh, yeah. In the warehouse. Yeah. Well, I saw them and when they came here for the for 2003 concert. <clears throat> and uh, at the arena. The Eagles. Yeah. The, oh, I saw the Eagles uh, in 2003 uh, at uh, the arena. And it was a great show. They just played here a couple of weeks ago as well. Another, you know, just a great show. And in 2003, when I saw them, they want, the Eagles had five encores to their performance. In the third encore, they, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Don Henley or Glenn Fry. one of them said, we, the next song we're going to play is the first, the first time we ever played this song live was at the warehouse here in New Orleans, and the place erupted. And I'm sitting there going, you got to be kidding me. None of you were even there. Not, not all 18,000 of you here. We only had maybe 1,000 people see them the first time they played. It was funny. Uh, it was funny how that thought even came in mind. Uh, but I didn't go to the one two weeks ago. However, um, I must have had 30 phone calls the next day that people were saying, oh, the warehouse, they said, talked about the warehouse. What song was it? It was Take It Easy, which was really kind of funny because the club that I was opening pre right before Katrina blew it up was uh, called Easy Street, New Orleans. And uh, their song, I mean, I planned on playing that song there a lot. Take It Easy, Easy Street. If you would tell us just... Uh the general 70s scene in New Orleans. Uh, you own the, the coolest music venue in town, freaks and long hairs and women and drugs, and uh, you're running around like the king of New Orleans. Over here. Well, not really. I mean, we were, you know, we, uh, we were laid back. You know, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I wasn't out running around with the drugs and the women. <laughs> However you said that. I can't remember that. But, uh, it was, you know, and there were a lot of great people in other businesses, you know. I just, you know, they had uh, great places where when the shows were over, we'd, we'd take, depending on who the groups were, we would take people down to the French Quarter. And Luther Kent was just had an awesome band, and we would, he played at the Absent Bar at the time. He wouldn't even start to 1.30 in the morning. Um, uh, uh, Johnny Vendigny was in another group down at the, I think it was called the Ivanhoe. They had places uptown that were not live music clubs, Trinity's and the Red Line and a few places where we would bring people. Um, we would like, you know, and, and one of the most fun things that we liked doing, again, to promote New Orleans music was at one point, I think it was from seeing the, uh, one of the sports association do it for like a, a Sugar Bowl event or whatever. Um, we saw that they had a brass band at the airport to, to meet the people coming in. Light bulb went out. So I became friends with Duke Dijon, who had the Olympia Brass Band. And every time 
that we, at a, after, at a certain point, and again, I don't know when that point was either, um, we would bring, we'd take Duke and, his, and the Olympia Brass Band to the airport. He would never know who he was looking for, and I'd be, you know, somebody would be off on the side, and we'd just sort of nod, and he'd to him. They'd start playing and just parade through the airport, disrupt the, the, the airport. And the British bands particularly loved it. They went crazy. It was really a lot of fun. Can you tell us uh, some of the bands that you became good friends with? Well, I was, um, I was, I was friends with Chicago from knowing them from that, that era. Um, you know, I, I didn't really become good friends with a lot of them because they were in and out, you know, in and out, in and town, out of town. But um, we, we tried to do everything we could to make their stay here in New Orleans as uh, hospitable as possible, uh, you know, bringing them and introducing them to restaurants and things like that. I did get involved with Gino Vanelli's career. I, w I worked with him for five years and did every aspect of it, uh, from concert promotion to running tours to being involved with his Brother the Brother album, the last album, in a management capacity. And... Um, He's probably the closest one that, I, that, that I've made contact with. Um, but I just had Chicago here not too long ago, and it was fun seeing some of the guys, except not all of them are the original band. You know. Tell us about uh, ZZ Top recording Fandango. Don Fox story. Okay. I wasn't here. Oh, it was after 75? Yeah, I think it was after 75. Okay. It may have been. Or may, if it was, I don't know, but it was, you're going to get, you get a better story from Don Fox. Okay. What about Bob Marley show? Was that after? Seven after, years? that was. Do you know all the guys in Fall Gap? Did you know them? No. I mean, I knew them then. Because when I was. Thank you, all that. When I was, when I was working in L.A., I worked with an editor who was from here who said he was the backup drummer at one point. For Fall he could have been. So I'll have to get, I can't remember his name, but I can find out. Yeah. When was the moment you knew you had something really special? Um, I thought when I'm sitting in the Fillmore East and I'm watching this show and I'm watching the people, because I was watching it more than just listening to Chicago. I mean, I, I love them, and it was their influence on me that even started this whole thing. Um, I just knew if, if I could find a place, if I could get the money, get, the, get everything together, that if we opened something like that, it would be great. You know, it was a struggle, but it, it still was a lot of fun, you know, uh, during that era. And as, and look at you guys, you weren't even here. And you're doing a documentary on it because you've heard about it. So uh, it, 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 it's like it, it really did affect people a lot, you know, um, more people than I could even imagine. And, and that's exciting to hear that. Um, but we, I just knew or felt, you know, and you, sometimes this only happens to you once or twice or three times in your life. And, and that's why you can, if you have a dream about something, you have to, I think you really, truly, you've heard enough people in your lives, I'm sure, and I know I've heard it enough that if you have a dream, you really have to take it all the way to the end. You can't quit on it. I mean, I'm doing a show here as the entertainment manager here at Harris. Uh, I've been working on a, a little project called Joints Jumpin', and I started it in 1984, developing it. And it's basically a musical celebration of New Orleans rhythm and blues from the 50s and 60s. We have this big band, nine-piece band, six vocalists, and it's coming back the second weekend of Jazz Fest here in this theater uh, for the third time. People love it. And uh, it's exciting, and I'm hoping to take it to a bunch of other Harris uh, venues, casinos, theaters around the country, and um, we'll see. But it's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying that dream. You can't, you may, it may not happen right then and there. Like, I'm sure you guys are experiencing it with this documentary. I mean, there's, you got this dream. You want this thing to happen. You want this to be put in the film festival, something. And... You can't quit, no matter what obstacles you run into. And that's how we were. <clears throat> um, you know, all of us. Don, Brian, John Simmons, myself. No, we would never quit. 
we, you know, we, and the, op, the major obstacles we had was the, the money things. But we were very fortunate to have people around us that uh, would step up to the plate and help us. So obviously those people must have thought that we had something. Can you tell us a little bit about the radio station y'all ran out of the warehouse? Yeah. Uh, WJMR Radio, which is a kick. Um, I don't recall exactly how it star how we, <clears throat> how we got it there, but I do know that in that era, the radio stations, even though FM radio was coming on board and was there, it, they, not everybody was playing all the music that we were bringing in. And there was a gentleman by the name of Bob Peel that um, worked at WJMR, and I guess we would buy some advertising or we would do something there. And we finally worked out a way that we could uh, get the radio station for a few hours at night, have a remote, and it would be done. We had, uh, it was above our office, and the radio station was set up there and everything. It was just incredible. And as a matter of fact, my youngest brother used to live there, stayed there, so nobody would break in. And I don't know what he was going to do if they did break in, but no one <laughs> would break in. That was his, that was his job. And... Um, it was really a lot of fun, and it sort of tied into, uh, you know, things that we had to do sort of out of the box. Like we had to start In Your Ear, which was a, um, a, a publication that we did that um, we would always get, whenever we booked an act, we would always get from the booking agent, we would get a photograph and we'd get a bio. So we took it a, a, a step further. Edwin Krebs was the... Um, um, first editor that did the paper. And, and what we would do is he would get different people, and we would talk to different people, and they would write articles, or they would do things. Karen, Karen Olivier was a, a big force in this in the very beginning. And uh, they would just laid it out. And I'd go sell the ads to pay for this thing. And then we eventually were able to build a, mail, a mailing list. So we would give this out for free. It would be paid for by the advertisers. The, the people who came to the shows could clip out the little coupon, put it in on a mailing list, and eventually we got so many names, we had to start charging a dollar a year to help pay for this thing. And we had, we had names from New Orleans up to Arkansas, from Texas over to Florida. Thousands and thousands and thousands of names. But we had to do things like that. Now, I don't know why we did it other than we knew... We just couldn't count on the radio stations or the, you know, the, the whole industry here because everything was so new. If you would tell us uh, about broadcasting the Holman Brothers live from the radio station for the New Year's Eve shows. Um, don't recall how that happened, but I know, I, I know they pl the, the Almond Brothers played three New Year's Eves in a row, and it was absolutely spectacular. Uh, as, as strong as they were in the warehouse and in this community, to be here on that day for folks who were out in the, every, the whole city's in a very festive mood, um, they were, it was just exciting. And those shows always started early and wound up real late. They were fun shows. And I think that, I, and I don't know how, I don't know about the recording part of it. I don't remember. I remember it was on, but I don't remember what year or when or whatnot. See, today, if you try to do something like that, you got to go to ASCAP, BMI, you got to go through 8 million licensing organizations, you got to do this, you got to do that. And before it's all over, said, and done, it probably cost you, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to try to do it. In those days, it was just like, okay. You just broadcast. Okay. No problem. Well, yeah, you know, but you'd get permission. It's okay. Because, you know, we weren't trying to make money on a deal. We were just trying to, again, expose not only the artists, in this case the Almond Brothers, but also expose the talent, this incredible talent that was coming to this venue. Do you think you were successful with that, with, uh, with helping push, like, get the Almond Brothers out there? Do you think they Well, help? yeah, it, it, you know, New Orleans, you know, I know, I'll never forget at the time when they did their um, Almond Brothers Live at the Fillmore West album. And they were strongly considering doing it at the warehouse. But when you look at San Francisco versus New Orleans and the media markets and everything, it just, 
you know, they have it all over us. So there was nothing we could really do. I mean, that we had nothing to do with it. It was strictly their decision, and I certainly understand why it was their decision. How were you able to book all these great bands that ended up looking back now legends? Well, you have to remember back then they were just starting to. They had it was it was a brand new industry. Bill Graham uh, was our he was the icon. I mean, he's the one that basically started this, as far as I'm concerned. I know there were other acts that would tour and perform and do things, but um, I think for this rock and roll era, I think Bill Graham was the one that was singularly the most important person to be part of it. And then agencies became, were getting real professional. There was premier talent in New York and APA and a bunch of other, William Morris and a bunch of agencies. And what happens is word spreads fast. So once there's a little bit of success, once some band had a good time, can make a little money, did whatever they, they felt successful, uh, the word would spread. And then so even though, like I said, Hank Newman was the gentleman that lived in Chicago that we knew up there, uh, through the agency was able to book the very first show. But then after that, we sort of did it on our own. I mean, because people would call us or we would call them and tell them who we were and where we were and whatever and talk to them about it. Did you ever have any police raids or, or legal troubles, or was the, the city on your side or against you? Um, well, we, the warehouse itself didn't have any raids. Um, there were many times when um, parents would literally come in and I saw a couple of times drag their daughter out by the hair, uh, grab the son and say, you know, younger kids and not let them in. Uh, besides the Grateful Dead getting busted, um, at one of the hotels, the, the Almond Brothers got busted, Marie Antoinette Hotel, and that was just very strange because Don Fox and I were in a room with all the money to pay the group, and we're hearing at the, the disco that they had downstairs, they're playing uh, Midnight Rider, the Almond Brothers song, and it was midnight, and then the cops were knocking down the doors and busting them for whatever reasons and whatever. Um, so there were, in that era, but it wasn't, I, I think it was the long hair, hippie feel, the whole the era, the, the music, the whole thing. You know, and... So how did you meet Don Fox? Uh, Don and I worked together at Barnaby's. Um, he worked, we all, I mean, that was such a, it was a great part of town in Chicago. It was called the near north side of Chicago. And Brian Glenn, who was our partner also, he worked one place, Fox would work another place, and I worked another place. And as when and in all these places they would all, you know, like anything else, say, This place is hot right now, then all of a sudden this place over here opens and it's hot. At one point Barnaby's became the hot place and uh, I was working as a bartender and Don was the uh the uh, uh, bouncer ID checker. And so we started there. And then it was after that that we, uh, him and Brian wanted to come down. And, uh, and it was just natural for them to, to be involved in ownership as opposed to my two roommates because my two roommates had absolutely nothing to do with, that, with the industry. Except they were really fun, great guys, but that, this wasn't their thing. It was just perfectly natural for Fox and Brian to do it. Who's you said the, the standout, your favorite act that, that you saw play? Boy, you know, I knew at some point in my life this question was going to be asked. And I, I don't know if I can just say, I mean, the Allman Brothers are right up there. Joe Cocker's, Joe Cocker, Mad Dogs and Englishman show, right up there. The Who, right up there. Uh, Rod Stewart, when he played with Faces, right up there. Um, even Elton John's first show, I mean, one and only show he did. And then the Eagles, I mean, they like, they were all, I had so many, I don't know if I can, I don't have one that I can say this one was better than any of the other ones. And the, uh, a 
lot of people told me there's almost perfect sound in the warehouse. Did y'all do anything special in the roof of the Raptors? No. Or was that just a natural thing that happened? You know, I, I, don't, I don't really know because I'm not a tech person, but I, I really don't know. You know, and I know no one really ever complained. They complained it was hot. They complained occasionally it was cold. But, you know, it was really funny. Last week, you know the story. You were here. You were talking to Johnny Winter. But before you were talking to Johnny Winter, his, uh, his road manager, Paul Nelson, I, I said, Paul, these guys are doing their thing on the warehouse and blah, blah, blah. Oh, got to set up an interview for him. And Johnny Winter told Paul, he says, all I can tell you is, the only thing I remember was the warehouse was hot. <laughs> How about the bathrooms? I heard the bathrooms were a blast, too. Oh, they were. They, I mean, it, it was like, you know, in that era, because we were part of that hippie crowd as well. We were young guys. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we did everything we, the best we possibly could do, considering the resources that we had. You know, we, it's not like we had so much money and we said we're going to skimp on this we did everything we could do the best we could do it and you know the the heating situation was and we tried to pipe in air condition very expensive and it really didn't work we were then going to put in uh, Stanley Shotan was, I'll never forget Stanley, he's a great guy. He uh, was our electrician that was there all the time. And, and uh, Stanley was putting in this, he came up with the idea, or Brian came up with the idea of um, Fox, I don't know who came up with the idea of doing this air flow system. At least let's just get this air moving. So the, the day we decided to do, well, we're doing it, we've been working on it. Now we have one last day to have it ready for the show that night, which happened to be Elton John. Well, it rained the whole day. That airflow system didn't work. It wasn't even up and running yet. And you can imagine, and you know, being from New Orleans, how hot sometimes it gets and humid right after that rain. Oh, Elton John was a trip. Well, I know we paid him 10000 that night. So even as a young person, because... Uh, my song was already out, and it was huge, and he was a big number for us. But all we could tell him, you know, without screaming at him, we would just say, come out and just play. I know it's hot. You know, we're losing our butt. Just play. <laughs> we heard a story about a guy trying to sneak in through the fan in the roof. Remember that? No. You would uh, tell us that the typical crowd at the warehouse? Oh, I would say that I would say the typical crowd, they were between the ages of 15, 16, and 30. You know, I would think that would be it. Um, young people, just everybody really, mostly into music, people that really cared about music or the particular act that was playing there that night. And um, we didn't do demographic information and all that other stuff that people do today on, on you know, on who was coming. Other, the only thing we had was our mailing list. You know, we could tell where people came from, from that mailing list. And they came from everywhere. There was a station in town, not in town, there was a station called, it was in Little Rock, Arkansas, called K-A-A-Y at that time. And it came on very late at night, but it was, it broadcast everywhere. So we would occasionally buy uh, time on that, you know, and that really helped us as far as spreading the word to get people when they were coming into town to come there. I think that's what helped, you know, besides the, the times when people would come in town, Mardi Gras and whatever, uh, that, would, that would be another way to get people to come in and have them sign. That's when they would sign up and whatnot. You tell us a little bit about the uh, backstage scene and uh, cooking red beans and rice. Oh, and beans. Willie. God, Willie. I don't remember Willie's last name. Willie Jackson, maybe? Willie. 
what an incredible guy he was. I, I, you know, and I, I, didn't, I wish I knew how to get a hold of him right now. I'd love to see him. Um, he and his family would cook red beans and rice. Well, all of a sudden, rice started to appear. Not initially, but they started to appear. They wanted this, they wanted that, they wanted everything. I'll never forget, they wanted, uh, we used to have to hire limousines to go pick up these rock and roll people. So we said, no more. We went out and bought two used ones. And we'd put a little tie or hat on somebody, whoever was around, and they'd go pick the people up so we wouldn't have to incur that expense. And the same thing with the hospitality and the, and the uh, dressing room. Well, we'd, we'd give them whatever. We'd give them, you know, we wanted to take care of them. We wanted to make their stay, like I said earlier, you know, wanted to be great in New Orleans, wanted them to love the place so they're going to come back and tell their friends about it. And we got Willie. Don't remember where he came from, but uh, the man was awesome. And he and his family would cook the red beans and rice, and they'd put on a spread. And he was such a great person that the, uh, the people loved him because they'd stay up there the whole time with the, uh, with the musicians. And then Willie also was responsible for cleaning up the place besides cooking and everything. This gave him some extra money. You want to talk about any crazy stuff that happened backstage? No. Not me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. I don't know what happened back there. <laughs> so over the five years that you were there, uh, was that uh, maybe the craziest thing somebody did on stage or a musician or somebody in the crowd or... Besides Jim smashing the stage up? Uh, I, th I have to tell you a story, but it didn't take place right in the warehouse. And it was the craziest thing, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. Sly and the Family Stone. We had them at Municipal Auditorium. Sold out. The equipment's on stage. The band's here. Right before they're going on, the road manager comes up and says, he's not going on. So John Simmons had to go up and say, Sly and the Family Stone show is canceled. We had to give people their money back. We're going to reschedule the day. Reschedule the day. A few months later, comes back. Sold out again. Same thing happens. Didn't go on. Don't, could never find out why he couldn't, didn't go on or want to go on or whatnot. Didn't know if it was... Didn't we know what it was related to? So we had we sued him through the musicians union, and we won the lawsuit. And it was nothing compared to what we lost. Uh, and part of the deal was he had to come back to the city, and play for us. So we played at City Park Stadium, and it's a horseshoe. So we set the stage up to sh look at the horseshoe. And the box office was up in the press box when it, where the sports reporters and everybody watches the games there. So, I mean, eventually he gets on stage and he, he did play. And um, so I take the manager up there and when he walks in, he walked in to see about four or five big security people and four or five New Orleans police officers. So we just told him to sit down and enjoy the show. You know, because that was it. You know, I mean, it was like it's, it's not a very exciting story, but it was what, what we went through, and what the people in the city went through. Yeah, because even my dad told me about that. He did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He bought tickets and they said sign up. It was amazing. Later. They yeah. kept canceling yeah. and not showing yeah. up, or but never an explanation yeah. of why. Huh. You know, the other crazy things was we had signed contracts with Jimi Hendrix and, jo and Janis Joplin, and they both died before they came there. Um, I, I just think that I, I don't, you know, nowadays and even, even earlier, I would never think about a lot of the negative things that may have happened, you know, things like, you know, the cars getting broken into where we had to start hiring the police and... Oh, now that's a funny story. The first time when um, we get, 
we had to get a police detail because we are, I mean, the cars were literally being broken all up and down around uh, the warehouse. Chapachulas and Felicity was not a great part of town. And so the first night that we had the police patrol, um, the head guy who worked for the, um, I'm not going to mention any names, but the, he worked uh, for the police. He worked out of Harry Connick's office, district attorney's office. And Do you know his name? I think they've given it to us. Um, Ruiz? Yes. Frank Ruiz? Yes. They told us to talk to him. Oh, yeah, definitely talk to him then. Right. If they told you, who told you, George? I think two people. I think George and somebody else said talk to Frank. He used to run all the details. He should have stories to tell. He was the guy that, he was the guy that John Simmons met initially that became in charge of our detail. But the first night, when the show's over and he's, they man in the streets and they're going through and this and that and whatnot, when it's time to leave, he comes with a, like a Schwegman's pa a sack, paper bag. And I'm sitting behind my desk doing something and he comes up to me and says, Bill, he says, you want any of this before I leave? I said, no, Frank. Well, you know, what he had in there was everything on the planet, I'm sure. I didn't even want to look. <laughs> I didn't care. Please leave. <laughs> and it was funny. You know, we all knew what was in there, you know, and it was like, no, -uh, not going there. Uh, if you would tell us a little bit about Smoke Patrol. John Diaz. Uh, John Diaz was in charge of the Smoke Patrol. And we, we couldn't allow smoking in the place because if you allowed smoking cigarettes in the place, they could smoke whatever they wanted to smoke. So, and that's against the law, and we couldn't do that. We couldn't, we couldn't just turn our head to it. So we had to put up a front, and it was a battle. So we had the staff, we had a number of folks that would wear it. We would give, gave them the warehouse shirts, jerseys. They would wear it so people could identify them, and they'd run around with their little flashlights, and when they'd see somebody light up, they would ask him to put it out, and John did it. And he was—he was—he was a short guy, but I mean, he was ferocious. And then he, like I said, his father at one point saved this, and he got involved, you know, in, in the ownership. Was there any film footage shot? Um, there was—I know in the movie *Mad Dogs and Englishmen*, they had people uh, shooting uh, his tour his entire tour, and I think a little section of it made, uh, made the, uh, that movie. I think you changed tapes.